Welcome to the third module in the serverless machine learning course. In this module, we're going to cover feature selection, model training with those features, batch inference with those features, and managing the models in the model registry. So to get started on feature selection, we're going to look specifically at something called a feature view. That's a set of features that you select from the feature store to train models with, how you can create training data and feature vectors from a feature view, how we can do what we call transformations or model-specific transformations with a feature view. We're going to also look at training pipelines, hyperparameter tuning, model architectures, the model registry, and batch inference pipelines. Let's get started with feature selection, which is a very big topic in its own right. And in the very first introduction to machine learning lecture, we actually introduced this topic briefly. So we said that when you're selecting features, some of the properties that are not desirable for features are that they're redundant. So if you've already selected a similar feature, so imagine you have a model that has temperature in Celsius and you add another feature, which is temperature in Fahrenheit, that's a redundant feature. And it's not going to add to the predictive capability of your model. It'll add more data, which means more compute, and also might mean that it takes longer for your model to converge. So redundant features should be removed. Um, there are techniques you can use, for example, a correlation matrix that we saw in the feature store that's automatically computed, or you can create one uh, or compute one yourself using Pandas can help you identify redundant features. Irrelevant features should be pretty straightforward. If the feature has no predictive power over your model whatsoever, then you shouldn't include it. You know, it's very easy to say, well, I'll just add more and more features because I have a feature store. Um, but if they're irrelevant, it's going to take longer for your model to converge more compute it'll require to train it, and it won't help with the predictive power of your model. And then finally, and importantly, there are prohibited features out there. So you may not want to train your model using gender, for example, because then your model may become biased towards a certain gender. Um, there are what we call uh, artificial intelligence legislations and norms that have uh, evolved in many different uh, domains and many different geographical areas. But ultimately, you as a data scientist or as a machine learning engineer are responsible for building these AI systems. And it's your responsibility to make sure that they're ethical and the features that you use um, will not introduce, for example, bias against ethnic groups or genders or some other subgroup of people. So it's important to be aware of which features you're allowed to use and which ones you can't. We see in the feature store that you can use metadata, tags, schematized tags, to attach these to features so that you'll understand when a feature maybe is not able to be used, for example, in the European Union, because it, it uh, is um, prohibited due to GDPR. Now, when we talk about feature selection in terms of the feature store, we have to consider that the features are stored in a scope called a feature group. So this is our table of features. So when you have many different tables of features, you can think that as a data scientist or machine learning engineer, you can come in and browse for the available features and find the ones that you think are useful, identify those features that have predictive power for the predictive problem you're trying to solve, and you're done. But you're not, because when you want to take features from many different tables, you're going to have to join them together to create training data, or what we call a feature view that we'll see in a little bit. So in order to, to join tables together, you do need something called a join key, which will be common between the two tables. Now, in lecture number two, we talked about uh, data models, and we talked about this idea of having a star schema or having one big table. But in any relatively large system, you're never going to have one la large table that covers all of the features. It's going to be partitioned up into many smaller tables. And those tables will have primary keys and often the tables may be split around different entities, as we use the term. So we may have a customer as an entity, we may have a product as an entity. And in those cases, what you'll have is you'll have an identity, an identifier for the user or customer, an identifier for the product. And that becomes a natural, what we call join keys. You may have a, a table that has information about the customers, you may have a table that has information about the product, so attributes of the product and attributes of the customer. And then you may have a table about products purchased by customers. So in that way, you can join together features of customers with products by using this table where the users bought this product, and now we can join attributes of that product or features of the product with 
attributes of the customer together by using the two join keys, the product ID, the customer ID, and then this table which joins them together. Now, one of the things to be careful about when you're selecting features for your models is to not select too many. This is what we call feature debt. And a truism is that once you've added features to a model and you've trained a model and the model is performing relatively well, there's subsequently a huge disincentive for users to remove those features. So what happens is that features tend to accumulate. And particularly where you have a, a team where you have maybe people join the team and leave the team, then people don't necessarily know which features actually have predictive power or not. So often you may be able to use feature importance to understand which features contribute to a given performance or accuracy of a given model, but that's not always the case. It depends on the machine learning algorithm you're using. So if you're using deep learning, it's very hard uh, to infer which features uh, contributed uh, to the overall accuracy or performance of your model. Maybe with uh, classical techniques like decision trees, you, you can use uh, Shapely, um, you can use um, if, uh, feature importance, which can help uh, you understand which features contribute most to the performance of your model. But in any case, it, it's a good practice to ensure that you don't just throw the kitchen sink in there. You don't just add features and then when you're happy with performance, you're done. You need to also trim uh, and remove uh, unnecessary features to avoid feature debt. Now, selecting features can be done either while you're experimenting. So experimenting means that you're you know, selecting some features, you're creating training data, training a model, evaluating the performance of the model. And when you're happy enough, you may say, okay, I'm now gonna productionize this by writing a pipeline for uh, training the model. So you, you can do the feature selection either offline during experimentation, but you can also do it as part of a training pipeline. So you can have the feature selection as a specific step. So it may be just the case that you're selecting features from different feature groups, join them together, and that's the step in your training pipeline. But you can also apply some of the techniques that we'll look at now to, um, to help you know, remove some of the features that, that are not necessarily gonna to contribute to model performance. So one example um, of a technique, and these are taken from the Scikit-Learn website, which has a good section on feature selection, is that you can obviously remove features with low variance. So if there's low variance in your feature, that means there's not gonna be much information content. So in, from an information theoretic perspective, if the value is always the same, well, there's not gonna be much predictive power in that particular feature value. Um, you can use techniques such as recursive feature uh, elimination. Now you may have a need, for example, to reduce the number of features to a certain amount. Maybe your feature store costs uh, a huge amount uh, for every new feature you add, uh, or maybe you have a certain limited amount of uh, resources where the model will be used in production. So you have to reduce the number of features to a fixed number. So you can use recursive feature elimination to do that. If you have spare compute, you can also trade off compute to help select better features. So you can use techniques such as feature importance to compute the relative contribution of a given feature to a feature um, uh, accuracy, a, feature, a model's accuracy or, or, or uh, performance. And one technique is select from model, which is where you um, uh, compute or estimate the relative importance of the different features for the model and then select the ones that have highest performance. And you can iteratively do this until you've, you've trimmed your model to, to uh, enough, to a, a small number of features that you're happy with. And you can do that also in a sequential manner. Again, model-based where you, you perform compute to, 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 to understand the relative importance of the features. And then you're going to then select them uh, in, as part of your, your pipeline and say, well, these are the features that I want in the end. Now, there's an example here uh, taken from the Scikit-Learn webpage again, whereas we're only selecting two features from the Iris data set. And as you remember, in the Iris data set in our first lab, we had four features. We had the petal length and width, and we had the sepal length and width. So you can see what's happening here is that, and if we look at the code here, uh, we can see here that, um, let's go. So we have loaded the Iris uh, data set, and we've only got the features here, and then we have the labels in Y here. And you can see what it's doing is it's using this module called select k best, and it's from the feature selection um, module in sklearn or package in sklearn. Uh, 
So what you can do is you can basically say, I'd like to use the chi squared uh, technique, and I'm going to set a hyperparameter of two. That means I basically want to have two features. Now we know that there's four in the original uh, feature set. So what this is going to do is it's going to uh, use a model. So this is the chi squared model to estimate the two best features for this particular, from this particular data set. So you can see we end up with two, two features. We have 150 rows and we've only got two features left. So X new, um, our new set of features, we'll only have two of them. Then the question is which ones were selected? So you can run this code to figure out what this particular model will select as the two uh, most powerful features from the RS data set. So Uber performed an interesting experiment with a data set that had 75 features. So they took in a data set with 75 features, wanted to train a model with it. And what X-Ray, their information theoretic approach to selecting features was able to do, it's a system, it was able to evaluate 2000 features from the feature store. So from the Uber feature store. And you can see here that the original 75 features, that's this one here, had. 28 originals and 47 new features. So 28 from the original and 47 new. That's the green one here. Um, we had the original 75, which is here. This is uh, just 75, no features in the feature store. And that's this point here. And you can see that the area under the curve, which is here on the y-axis, was much lower when we just took the original 75 features. Um, the number of features is here on the x-axis. So. What you could do is you could take the original um, 75 features and uh, in this green dot here that we looked at, we added um, tw this 28 of the original features, sorry, and 47 new. So that, that brought you up to here. And that gave you very nice uh, accuracy. But you could even reduce the number of features even further to this point here, where you have only 37 features. And remember, um, 37 features is much lower than 75 features. So um, that means less compute less time to train and less data to store for the model. So we're going to move on and talk about feature views and model specific transformations. And the feature view, you can think of it as being as the end result of feature selection. So when you go to the feature store and you look for different features and different feature groups, you're going to select them and you'd like to say, well, I want to train a model with some features from the, um, in this case, we have the CC underscore trans underscore fraud feature group. And I'd like to use some other features from our aggregated feature group with the uh, aggregated four hour features called CC underscore trans underscore fraud four hours. So I'm gonna take some features from both of these feature groups and I'd like to use them to train a model. So we, we need training data at the bottom. And then I also want to use those features to make predictions. So we're gonna have some new data comes in I'd like to predict if this new credit card data is suspected of fraud or not, whether that's online or batch, it doesn't really matter. So the, the basic idea is that we have a feature view, which is a logical representation, a, a view in database terminology means not a copy, but, but a, a logical view over the features. So when you create this thing called the feature view, you're not going to create new data. It's just going to be some metadata saying, well, we have a view that consists of some features from this feature group up here. Um, uh, CC underscore trans fraud and some other features from the aggregated feature group. So how do we build this feature view? So what we need to do is we need to basically, first of all, select the features. So you say, I'd like the uh, category feature, the amount feature, and you have to also specify the join key as well. So when we join them together, we need to make sure that these features can be put together. The feature view also, because it's a model specific representation of features, also we need to say for supervised machine learning, what are the labels? You can see it's an array here of values, not just a single value. So in this case, we have a single value here, but, but it's a single value inside the array. So you can have more than one label potentially. Um, then we have, uh, let's have a look. We can also attach a filter in here. So when we create a feature view, you can say, oh, I, I, any models I train with this feature view are only going to be for customers who, who live in the US of A. So that means basically we're going to add a filter here and say country equals USA. Now, sometimes you may, you may say, well, actually this model is gonna be for all our users globally. We're gonna use all of the features, um, but I may need to remove some of the features for some countries. You can also apply filters at the training data set level as well. 
So you can include your features here, and then when you create training data, you can say, well, I only want um, to create training data for users from the USA or from, from the EU, because I'm going to train a model for uh, customers who, are in, who live in the EU. Now, you may think, okay, well, if you use that filter when you're creating training data, what happens when you're doing inference, when you're doing batch inference, or when I'm doing inference um, uh, online? Well, in fact, um, it, in this case, what, what's going to happen is the user's country will be uh, a, a parameter, of course. So if I'm doing inference on users from the EU, well, I'll have a model trained on data with customers only in the EU. So the new model I'm going to score on this inference data should only be for customers from the EU. So it should happen before the uh, model is actually used. I should look at this inference data and say, well, this is coming from a user in the EU, so I'm going to send it to the EU model that was trained. Or this is data coming from some customer in the States, so I'm going to send it to the model that was trained for customers in the States. So we don't have to worry about the filter in the inference case because uh, at that point we should know um, uh, where the data is going to, which model it's going to go to, to get um, scored. Now you can also apply transformations to features. And this is what we call model-specific trans transformations. So we said before that features become much more reusable if you don't transform them. So if you don't do numerical transformations, so in this case, the min-max scalar, which will normalize a numerical feature. So it'll you know, uh, try, and, try and convert that, trans uh, transform that uh, distribution of feature values into a Gaussian or normal distribution. Uh, but these are what we call model-specific transformations. They happen after the feature groups. And they're done, you do them on uh, for a specific model or a feature view. So these transformations we can uh, define when we specify a feature view and say this feature will be transformed using this particular trans transformation function. So let's have a look at, at how, how that will look in practice with our two feature groups, CC trans fraud and CC trans fraud for hours. So we can see here we have. Um, the primary key, we have our event timestamp for the, the credit card transactions. We have a bunch of features. I've highlighted only two, the amount and the category. And similarly, we have the, the primary key as credit card number, the event timestamp as date time column. And then we have two features here, the location delta uh, moving average and the transaction frequency in the four hour period of time. So we'd like to, to, to join these features together. We want to join these two red features and the two green features together, and we can do that um, by joining on the CCNUM uh, primary key. And what we get are, is basically a table containing four features, effectively. Now, we haven't copied the data, so it's just a representation of these features. But what we can see that's interesting here compared to the feature groups that we covered from before is that we can see that, that we, we don't just have the feature name, we have the feature data type, so in this case the amount is a float, but we can also specify a transformation function that will be applied to the amount feature when it's read, either as training data or as inference data, so batch or online inference. So this transformation function is in fact a Python UDF, user-defined function. You can write your own ones and register them with the feature store, but there are some built-in ones that you can use such as minmax scalar. And this makes the feature view API quite interesting because it's no longer a, a classical table that you would have in a database that has a column and a data type for a column. It now also includes a transformation function applied to a given column. And that transformation function depends on the feature type. So if the, you have a numerical feature, yes, you can apply a minimax scalar, um, but you're not going to apply it to the, to the category here, which is a categorical feature. So this can get a little bit more complex when we want to create training data from our feature view. So remember, the feature view is this logical representation of uh, the set of features we're going to use to, to train a model with. Now, when we join together our, our different features, so when we draw, join the amount and category together with the location delta moving average and transaction frequency, we need to be very careful that we get we don't have what's called future data leakage. So if I take, uh, for example, um, we have this particular uh, credit card fraud table here, and let's assume we, that we have a third table with the labels as well, and the label gives us this particular um, timestamp down here, 
So this is this is going to be associated with our label. So we're going to have another column in here called fraud F, and then it'll be either true or not true, uh, not true. So the, this particular date time, what we want to do is make sure that the amount feature, the category feature, happen before or at the same timestamp as this date time. So when we're joining them together, we're going to say, okay, this is the 1st of January 2004 at 10 a.m. So this value here is okay. I can take these feature values because they're exactly the same timestamp. And we can see here that if we look at the second table, the CC trans, and we want to, 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 to join in these features, you can see that th this one here is not okay because it's in the future. So these two are, are, are on the 2nd of January. This one, however, is not at 10 a.m. on the 1st of January, but it's on, it's on midnight on the 1st of January. So that's before. So the most recent value of this feature uh, that's before 10 a.m. on the 1st of January 2004 is this first row here. So we're going to join those two rows together, and they're going to end up as the first row in our joined training data. And you need to do this for every row. Now, you don't have to write the complex code for this. We'll see that, that we have a nice, in Hopsworks, it's a very nice Python DSL. It looks like pandas. You're basically joining together um, uh, the, the feature groups. You're, you're selecting features in the feature groups and then calling join on them, just like you would in, in pandas. And um, then you get back uh, what we call a query object that, that, that encapsulates this point in time correct join. So we don't need to, to worry about it too much, but you need to know what's happening in the background, that the whole point of a, a point in time correct join is that we don't have any future data leakage when we create the training data. We don't want any future values uh, polluting that training data. Then a model will learn um, a relationship which just won't hold when it goes to make predictions because the future values won't be there when it goes to make predictions. Now let's get, get in and look at the syntax for the uh, feature view and how we create it. So I said that we should have a labels feature group in here as well. And we can see this is our labels feature group here. We also have the two other feature groups that we had on the previous slide. So what, what we're going to do firstly is get references to these three feature groups. And uh, once we have those, what we can do is we can select the features that we need to join these particular uh, features together. And we're selecting all of the features from the labels feature group together with the feature group trans, selecting all the features there. And then we're selecting all the features in, in the uh, final feature group, the uh, four hour aggregated features group. So we're basically taking all the features and selecting them and joining them together. This is what we call a domain specific language or DSL, because um, we call it a domain specific language because what's happening here in fact is that we're building up a query plan. And um, when you, create the feature view here, and you, you, you specify the set of features in this query object, so that's the query object we have here, it's the same query object down here. Um, when, when we use the feature view to create training data, what will happen is it, it'll execute a very complex SQL uh, query that it performs this point in time correct join on the back end. So at the back end, not in your Python code, but it'll be sent to the back end, which executes this query to join all the features together, and then you'll get back your training data, either as a data frame if it's not too big, but if it's bigger, it'll save it as files um, in the file system you want to store the data in. So it could be a bucket in S3, for example. So let's go back and look at the, 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 the syntax again. The, the creating of feature view is the same as feature groups. We have a version, we have a name, we have a description. Um, the only two things that are different is we need to supply the labels. In this case, is fraud is the feature that's our label. And then the query contains what are the set of features that are going to be used in this feature view. And there's some documentation you can read up on to, to find out more about this. Uh, so these are our two new uh, uh, attributes that we really need to add. Now, you can create a, a feature view um, from the feature groups like we saw. And the feature view is how we're going to read data from the feature store. So there's really two APIs for reading features from reading data from the feature store. One is what we call the offline API, and the second one is what we call the online API. And the offline API is to read large volumes of data, so from historical data. So we can read training data as data frames or files. We can read batch uh, data for inference, uh, so a batch of data that we want to perform offline inference on. Um, but if we have a model that's deployed online 24-7, um, 
and we want to get back just a single feature vector, just a row of features that we're going to use to score our model with, well, then we use the online API. So the feature view, to, to summarize, it, it, it contains the model's input features for training and um, an inference. It also has the label of the output. Uh, it is only metadata. So when you create it, it's, it's fast. There's only a small amount of data stored around it. And then we have these two APIs, the offline one for the large volumes of, of historical data it's going to process uh, in the background, and the online, which is a low latency, row warranted API for reading individual feature vectors or maybe batches of feature vectors. Um, so if you're, if you're scoring with lots of rows, you, might, you may need to read a batch back. So let's look first at the offline API. And um, it's used, as we said already, to create training data. So we can see our feature view here. Uh, it's, it's, you can see that we have time uh, going to on the, on the x-axis here in our feature view. So what this is trying to represent is that data is coming in, is being written through feature pipelines into the feature view. And time progresses more and more data is collected in the feature view. So if we look at, at, at training data v1 that we created from the feature view, well, we created it starting from training from the features that began at that point in time up until this point in time. Let's assume it's you know the day before this, so the end of February 2022. So we've trained data from the start time to the end of February 2022, and then we train our model. So we take that snapshot of data, and that's going to be our training data, and then we train a model with it. So once that data uh, has arrived and uh, the model has been trained, we can use the model to score new data that will arrive in the feature view. And this is what we call batch inference data. So if you have a feature pipeline that keeps writing data every day or every hour, that data keeps accumulating. So the data here in this particular time period, so it's for the, the one day period, the 30th of March, uh, 2022, uh, a certain amount of data was written on that day. And we'd like to use our model to score that new batch data. So what we want to do is use the feature view to read up that data. So we're going to have to supply a start time and an end time. And then we're going to get back a batch of data. And then we can make predictions with that batch and write the output somewhere. And the same is true here. We're doing it again for the next day. And that's how your model can be used for batch inference. And the feature view can be used to create this batch scoring data. Now, when we create training data from a feature uh, view, we I use the term training data, and we can think of it in, in the abstract. So the training data is the set of all of the data that's used um, both to train a model and to evaluate it. So the training data covers all of this. Now, when we split up training data into a train set, which we're gonna use to train a model with, and a test set, which is the holdout set that we don't train the model with. It cannot see this data at all until it's the last evaluation is performed on the model. So we can't use the test set, evaluate the performance of the model, and then go back and fix the model because we learned that its performance of the test set was bad. No, you only use it once at the end. If you want to use some uh, data to evaluate the performance of, for example, the hyperparameters in your training, you can use a validation set. So we're going to use a validation set to represent um, that uh, set or, or, or split of the data that can be used, for example, uh, to optimize hyperparameters. So this can be used uh, to, to evaluate the performance of a model for a given set of hyperparameters. And then you can update uh, those hyperparameters and then train again, and then again, score on the validation set. But only when you're finished at the very end, do you then take the last step to evaluate the more mo models accuracy on data it hasn't seen before. So it's it's potential to generalize. Um, now, I mentioned already that when we create training data from feature views, we have two options effectively. One is that we can create the training data and return them as pandas data frames. And we saw this in the first lab. And it's, it's the most convenient way. You can basically say, hey, I have a feature view. Give me back a train and a test set. And I want the features. And I want the labels, so we get x uh, underscore train. That's our set of features from the train set. We get uh, x un, large x underscore test, which are features from the test set. And we also get y underscore train, which are our labels from the train set. And y underscore tests are labels from the test set. Everything's great. And you can go off then and train and evaluate your model very easily. However, 
Um, sometimes you have more training data than you can fit in memory in your uh, uh, model training pipeline. So what you might want to do is say, well, I'll store that training data to files instead, because it's going to take a long time to run it. I can maybe even create the training data overnight, because selecting features from a feature store and saving them as training data, it can take a little bit of time. You've got to do this point in time correct join. You've got to get back uh, the, the, the features as, as a large data frame, and then you, you can either return that back to the client, or if it's too large, you can save it as files. So in Hopsworks, what happens, this is done at Spark, so you can have arbitrarily large training data. It can be terabytes in size. And then you want to save that training data in a file format that's matched to the model training algorithm you're going to use. So maybe you want to use TF record file format if you're going to train models in TensorFlow, CSV if you don't really care about the um, you know numerical accuracy of your, your floating point numbers because you're going to lose some of that with CSV files. Um, but it's a very convenient file format that works with almost every modeling framework. Now we saw in the first lab that we could do random splits on our training data into test validation and test sets. Uh, but you can also do temporal splits that I showed you on the previous slide you might want to do with a, with a feature view. And in enterprise machine learning, a lot of the time it's temporal splits. We see that, for example, in the credit card fraud example, we're, we're going to use a temporal split for that because you want to train your model on historical data and you're going to predict on new data as it arrives. So that means that a, a temporal split where you say train on the historical data and then save uh, the most recent data as holdout data or test data that you can evaluate the model's performance on. So when you, when you create files, I mentioned already that um, you can specify the file format and you can also specify where they're stored. So by default, if you just store them in Hopsworks, it'll store them in the file system in Hopsworks, which ultimately will be in a bucket in S3. Um, but you can also um, specify your own bucket in S3 or in GCS um, or in its Google, uh, uh, Google Cloud Storage or in ADLS on Azure, which is the, the uh, equivalent of S3 on Azure. So we can see here that, that the, this first one is, is creating data frames, and the second example here is just creating files, train data as files. But again, they're using the feature view, and here we're calling just training data to get back the features and labels as data frames. And in the second example, we're calling create training data on the feature view object to create the training data as files. Okay, so we can see that there. Now, I mentioned before that, that we've already looked at random splits in the iris example, and in the credit card example, we want to do a temporal um, split of the data. So, for example, if you have a training set for the years 2015 to 2021, your test set might be for the current year 2022. So, what you need to do is specify the start time and the end time for your training set, and the start time and the end time for your test set. And these timestamps will be used then by the feature view to uh, create the training set and then the test set. In this case, we're, we're creating training data as files, so we can say CSV file format. Um, we can decide that we, you know, we, we'll let the job run in the background because maybe it'll take a long time to complete. So we set wait for job to be true. And when you've CSV files, because it's uh, Hopsworks in the background is going to run a Spark job, which will have maybe many executors running in parallel. By default, each executor will write out its own CSV file. So if you have two executors, you may end up with two CSV files. Now, in Pandas, you can actually specify the directory and say, well, I'm going to read my data frame from this directory, which contains CSV files. And Pandas is smart enough to read up the CSV files and concatenate them together. You might think this is awkward. Um, and maybe you don't want to use Pandas. You want to use some other framework. So what you can do is you can return it as a single file using this coalesce option. So if you set coalesce equal to true, what will happen is in Spark at the back end is the executors that are creating the, the different data frame files in the default case will now send their, their data to what's called a driver in Spark. In Spark, you have a driver, which is a single uh, process, which is normally used just to coordinate these workers that perform the the, the splitting and the joining and the creation of files. But in this case, the workers will send all of their um, data frame data back to the to this single process, which will then write it out as a file. So this is what we call a bit dangerous in Spark because 
you can get what's called an out of memory exception. For example, if your driver only has two gigabytes of available memory, and then the workers send it four gigabytes of, of training data, well, it'll crash with an out of memory exception. Now, once you've created, in this case, we're creating files, uh, training data set files, and we're, we're, we're actually doing a test, we're doing a split, a, a temporal split, so train sets and test, test sets. So what that means is, in this case, well, we can't write this code here because we're not going to get back the validation set, but we can get back a train test split, um, which will just give us the X train and X test and Y train and uh, Y test. So we can read time series splits of them uh, and we get them back as data frames. Now, if, you're, if your data is, is, is too large to get back as data frames in Pandas and you're using uh, programs like TensorFlow, TensorFlow enables you to <coughs> train your, to read the data in as it's training. So you don't have to read all of the data into memory as a Pandas data frame in advance. You can read the data in with um, uh, the, the data set API in TensorFlow as, uh, as the model is training. It'll read batches of data from disk and then discard them when it's finished. Now, that was the offline API uh, for the feature view. We, I also mentioned there's an online API which you can use to retrieve individual feature vectors for online models. So when you have an online model and you want to make a prediction with a given customer, you might go to the feature store to look up some of the pre-computed features for that customer from different feature groups using the feature view. So you say to the feature view, you know, I would like to return um, all of the features um, uh, in this case, we can say that the, it's it's it, this fe this feature view object which which contains the features that are going to be used by the model. Um, we it, we're, we're going to retrieve all of those features, um, and we need to specify the keys for the feature groups that are used in the feature view. And in this case, um, and we can call keys. We can print out feature underscore view dot keys to see what the keys should be. In this case, we need a credit card number is the only feature that we'll need to, uh, or primary key that we'll need to supply here. And um, what we do is we basically say feature view dot get feature vector and pass in the primary keys. In this case, it's the credit card number for the user. And um, what we'll get back is an array of features that typically can be sent directly to the model to make a prediction with. Now, in this case, we've complicated slightly by saying, well, hang on, there's one of the features, feature A, it's going to be passed. And what, what we mean by saying it's passed is it's coming in, it's entered in the web app page. So in this case, we can see here it says this particular feature, age 38, is entered in the app web page. Um, other features may come from the feature store, such as this credit score here. And the primary key, in this case, the, the credit card number down here and the table up here, the user ID, they'll often come from the application session. You know, if you're doing credit card payment online, well, you'll know the credit card number because that's the one that's being used to make the payment. You may know, for example, also the location that the payment was made that comes again from the, the credit card terminal uh, and the amount paid and so on. So some of the features may come from the application. Many of them will come from the feature store. And in the get feature vector, you can say, well, past features, they come from the application. So I'm not going to retrieve that from the feature store, but the other ones I'll retrieve from the feature store. Now, one other subtle point here is that if we also introduce transformations so these model-specific transformations to some of the features in our feature view, well, they'll need to know what training data set version this model was trained on. And the reason they need to know that is because if I'm going to take a feature like age here, and I'm going to normalize it, so I'm going to divide it by the mean, um, subtract the mean and then divide by two, for example. Um, well, what, what I need to do is I need to know what was the mean value of age in the training data used to train the model. And we can get that by just supplying the training data set version. And then the feature view knows, OK, I have access to the statistics for this training data set. I will know the mean value of the age, for example. So then the transformation functions can retrieve that data uh, from the, the, the feature view when they're, computing, uh, when they're computing the transformation, such as normalization of the user's age. Um, and as I mentioned already, you can um, say which features you know, are, are, are passed and which ones come from the feature store. So I mentioned earlier that, that feature selection is often an offline experimentation uh, step when, when people are creating models. You can also turn it into a pipeline. And we could call this a feature selection pipeline. We haven't elevated it to the same level as feature pipelines, training pipelines, and inference pipelines. They're all needed. A feature selection pop pipeline is very much an optional step. Uh, the reason why you might want to have a feature selection pipeline is 
If you have a large volume of training data, you might say, well, I'm going to run this every night before I get into work. So when I get into work, it's going to take two hours to create the training data because it's just so massive. Um, so what you might like to do is create a, a feature selection pipeline. So a program that selects the features, optimizes them, creates the training data. And then it's going to have this, you're going to have a feature view and you have some training data from it. And you might schedule it to run during the night so that you have your train data ready in the morning, containing all of the new train data that arrived since uh, the day before. So we look a little bit more now at the model specific transformations. And we saw already that, that, that transformations can be attached to individual features in your feature view. So if we look at this particular diagram here, what it captures here, and there's no representation of the feature view because feature view is a logical uh, entity. So we have the dotted line here means the, the programs that are running. And then these uh, uh, rectangles here with the, with the completed lines, they represent assets. So, so we have feature groups, they're tables stored in the feature store. Training data, in this case, it might be files containing the training data. Models, again, files in the feature store or in Hopsworks. And then we have the different actions. So we have the feature pipelines create features that write to the feature groups. Then when we want to create training data, we're going to apply model-specific transformations and create the training data. And once we have training data, we can apply a model training pipeline to create models that are written to the model registry. And from the model registry, we can make batch predictions. But again, we need to read um, features to, to perform those batch predictions. For online model serving, so for online inference, we're going to have a model that's deployed and it's going to read again from the feature group. So both batch prediction and the model serving will read from the feature groups and both of them will apply the model specific transformations. What's very important here is that the model specific transformations that are performed uh, in the online case and in the offline case are exactly the same. So it has to be the same transformation code, but also the same state. So we need to know that the same training data set uh, statistics should be used to compute the transformations, both when you're training, but also when you're doing inference. And if you don't, what can happen is you can have what's called training serving skew. And training serving skew is not good, as you can guess, because it means basically that your model may not perform very well, but it'll be very hard to debug and understand the cause of that uh, bad performance in your model. Because maybe it's a subtle difference in, in how you transform a feature, Maybe you just use the wrong version of a training data set and um, you know, that it's not performing well, but it becomes very hard then to identify the, the root cause of that particular problem. But what you want to do, you have to ensure, is that, that whatever techniques you're using are you're eliminating training serving skew. Now, what we'll see also soon is that, um, that the, the feature store transformation functions are not the only way to do it. You can also do this with uh, transformation pipelines. So maybe you like scikit-learn transformation pipelines. So you can do it as part of your model training pipeline. What's important though is that the transformation objects that you create, you 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 save them along with your models so that when your model uh, is used in inference that you make sure you use exactly the same transformation pipeline object to transform the online features before they're fed to the model for predictions. Let's look at some of the code for defining uh, transformations as part of the feature view first, before we go into the scikit-learn case later on. Firstly, Hopsworks provides some built-in transformation functions. Here we have two examples. We have a min-max scalar, which is normalizing a numerical feature, and we have a label encoder, which takes a categorical uh, feature, in this case a label, and will encode it into a numerical representation. So what we can see here is that, that we can take uh, this categorical feature category and we can encode it into a numerical representation. Um, the amount feature, we can apply min-max scalar. And we're applying min-max scalar to all of these numerical features just to normalize all of them. Um, and this, this dict containing the transformation function, so the feature name and then the actual transformation function that would be applied to it, uh, we just supply this um, transformation function um, when we create the feature view. So we, we declaratively say, these are the transformation functions that we apply to the features uh, coming in this dict. Now, when you have a feature view with all of these transformation functions defined over its features, um, you can use this uh, to, to create your training data and to create your um, inference data. So let's have a look here at, at the first example. So we have 
uh, our feature view here that, that contains the transformation functions. We're calling it FV. And when we want to create training data, so it uh, has pandas data frame, so train test split, so it's random splitting uh, into train sets and test sets, what will happen is, is that this function will actually apply all of these transformation functions, they're, they're Python UDFs, user-defined functions, before it returns the values uh, of these four different data frames uh, to the client. So the transformation functions are applied transparently, um, which is very nice, you don't have to do any work. And the same happens also when we want to get inference data. So when we call fv.batch data, which we're getting batch data that we want to score with, now often we'll supply, um, we'll see later on an example that we'll supply the start and end time, but just for brevity's sake, we just, we're just going to get all of the, 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 the data in the feature view um, uh, as, as batch data. But basically when, when we call uh, dot batch data, again, the uh, transformations will be applied before it returns the data frame. And you can see here that we supply this TD underscore version because the feature view needs to know what state it will use uh, for the transformation functions. They need to know the training data set version because it's going to use statistics from it to implement these um, transformation functions. And the same is true in the online case. So when we call get feature vector, we're getting an individual feature vector and we're passing in the primary keys for the, the feature groups in this feature view. And when they're returned to the client, the client will apply these UDFs, these user-defined functions in Python, to all of the features defined in the feature view. And it will turn then the array of features containing the transformed feature values. This brings us on to training pipelines. And this is what you're going to go into a lot of detail in other courses. In this course, we're going to have a cursory overview of uh, many of the aspects of training pipelines. If you want to learn more, again, I would recommend you taking a, a course in model training uh, um, uh, to supplement what we cover in this course. Now, the first piece of advice I have for you, if you're going to try and use a model to, to build a prediction system, is if you don't have to train a model, don't do it. Use a pre-trained model. Um, and this is a whole area of research called transfer learning. Uh, a good example would be if your job is to, you know, uh, maybe classify a tweet uh, as having a certain sentiment. Sentiment we mean is it happy? Is it sad? Is it angry? Is it is it war? Well, Hugging Face, who, who are a very interesting company and provide lots of pre-trained models um, for downloading, they're open source. Um, they provide, of course, a, a sentiment analysis uh, model for for classifying tweets. So you. You shouldn't need to train this model again from scratch. They've done the hard work for you. So what we can think about with pre-trained models is pre-trained models, particularly in natural language processing, they've been massively successful. The natural language processing models have, have some very large uh, models that will take English language and often many other languages apart from English. Um, and they've been pre-trained on, on massive data sets like Wikipedias and so on. Um, but these, these very large language models, they're really just there to learn about properties of models. So what's the expected next word in a, in a sentence? Or if I remove this word, what word would I expect to appear there in that place? Um, what, what, what you'll find is that a lot of these very large um, language uh, models can be adapted to solve lots of smaller problems. I mentioned one example would be classifying the sentiment of tweets. But you also have question and answering um, with, with these language models, large language models, sequence labeling, and so on. So you can, I would recommend going looking at, uh, if you're doing large language models, looking in Hugging Faces and other places to find uh, a potential uh, good fit for you, a good pre-trained model that might just work. You can, of course, take the large language models and fine tune them with your own classifier, training your own classifier. If you have some um, uh, labeled data available, you can take the, the, the bare bones uh, transform. It's, they're mostly transformer architectures, which is an arch, a deep learning architecture. It, they, they need a lot of data. They need GPUs to train, so they're not easy to train. Um, but they're very um, performant on natural language processing, very high performance. So you can see this example here where we're saying, OK, if uh, some text is, is input, it's a movie review. I'm sure you can find a, a nice classifier for doing movie reviews. It says there was no plot to speak of, and there were no stars. 
So not maybe super easy to interpret if you're not a, a native English speaker, um, but it's kind of negative, right? So no plot speaker means there wasn't a good plot. Um, there were no stars implies there were no well-known actors in this movie. So maybe that's a bad thing. So if you don't need a model, if you don't need to train a model, don't. Just reuse one that exists. You probably still will need feature pipelines and batch inference pipelines, but it means maybe one third of your pipelines will disappear, your training pipeline. Now, if you do need a training pipeline, and we covered this in the first lecture, but we can see that there's, there's many different steps involved in, in training a model. Uh, we saw the feature selection step, which you could say is part of this training pipeline, and often it will be. Um, but we'll also have the model-specific transformations, if you want to use, for example, scikit-learn preprocessing pipelines or, or Keras preprocessing pipelines. Uh, you have hyperparameter tuning. You have a model architecture to define. You have to actually fit the data to your model, and then you have to evaluate your model. And the training pipeline as a whole, what it does is it, it reads training data using feature views to, to get the input to the model for training. Um, and when it's finished training, it's going to spit out a model. So it's going to publish a model to the model registry. So that's basically what the pipeline does. It reads train data in and it, and it outputs a model at the end of it. So let's look firstly at the transformations. This is the first step in our, in our training pipeline. And we already looked at including transformations in the feature view. Uh, declaratively, and there's some advantages of that, less code. Uh, but often you'll like, uh, there is a wider selection of available transformation libraries in scikit-learn, and maybe you're used to using them. So you say, well, I, I want to keep using the transformation pipelines in scikit-learn. So what you should do in this case is that you should make sure that you, 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 you when you fit your data to a transformation uh, pipeline object, uh, that you save it. You just save it in the model registry along with the model. So your model is going to be versioned and named. And you say, well, this was the transformation pipeline that was used with this model. And then when you need to make predictions with that model in your inference pipeline, you're going to read that same transformation pipeline object from the model registry, deserialize it, and then apply those transformations before you make the predictions. This will ensure that you have the same version of the pipeline object in training and inference. One thing you have to be careful with is that the environment in which you run your training and the environment in which you do your inference have the same version of scikit-learn. You may, for example, train uh, with a model from version 0.22, and then you want to do inference on 0.18, and there's some new feature that's being used in, in 0.22 that 0.18 doesn't recognize, and it doesn't work. So you need to be careful of ensuring that you have the same version of scikit-learn in both inference and in training. Um, MLflow, if you're curious, has a it specifies the uh, the dependencies of model in terms of the versions of the the Python libraries that are required, which is useful in this case. And in Hopsworks, um, if you use Hopsworks for model serving as well, um, you can run it in the same project as the training uh, is performed. This ensures, again, that you get the same version of scikit-learn in training and inference. But let's have a look at the code um, for how we, we, we can perform transformation pipelines in our training pipeline. So firstly, we can see that um, we're using joblib to serialize our, 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 our model object and our transformer pipeline object. And when we serialize them, we get a pickled Python object. So this is not PKL. This is our postfix or the file extension for the pickled Python object. And it's stored in our local file system. So joblib will store the files uh, for the model and our transformer pipeline object in the local file system, in this case, in a directory called cc underscore fraud. So um, when, we, when we basically want to publish these models to the model registry, we just pass in that directory and then when we save the model for, to the model registry, we pass in the directory and all of the files in that directory will get uploaded to the model registry to the model name and model version directories. So there, inside our model registry, we have a directory with the model names and inside that, you have another directory with the version of the models. So inside th those directories or folders, that's where you'll find both of your, uh, your, your, your pickled Python objects for the model and for the transformation pipeline. Now, when you want to use your model for inference, whether that's batch inference or whether it's for uh, online inference, you're going to download the model. So the first thing you do is you're going to say, okay, uh, 
um, get me the model from the model registry and this is the name of the model and the version and then you download into this local directory called model underscore dir and it'll give you our two pickle python objects that were that were written to the model registry so what we can do is we can actually load them then from the local file system uh, into memory as transformer and model objects and then we can use those then to apply the transformation steps and the predict steps and um, before we return the results now the next step in a, in a training pipeline after we've performed our transformations um, and, and this doesn't have to happen in order, of course. You know, Hyperparameter tuning is often the, what we call the outer loop. It'll happen outside and before um, uh, the actual training happens. So, so transformations often will be in the inner loop. Uh, but hyperparameter tuning, um, we saw in the first lab an example of hyperparameter tuning. So in the homework for the first lab, we asked you to change the number of neighbors in the k-nearest neighbor classifier and see how your model performed. That's what we call a hyperparameter. It's not updated during learning or training, uh, but we need to set it statically um, before we, we, we run the training. Now, other hyperparameter uh, hyperparameters, they can change over time. So during training, you could have a learning rate that starts high and goes lower over time, uh, but it's still not being updated by the model. So it's still a hyperparameter. It's something you're just changing uh, based on a policy, uh, based on the number of iterations, training iterations that have been performed to date. Now there's lots of uh, frameworks out there that help you uh, perform hyperparameter optimization. Hyperparameter optimization is expensive, it's computationally expensive. If you want to, for example, uh, in our K nearest neighbors example for our, um, our, our iris lab, if we want to try 10 different um, values of K, the near, number of nearest neighbors from one to, to 10. Well, that, now we have to train the model 10 different times. So that adds a lot more compute. So you want to do that in parallel so that it happens faster. There's a bunch of libraries that help you to do it um, in Python. So pure Python, you have skopt, hyperopt, and optuna. And these will launch separate parallel processes in Python. And you're, you're restricted to the number of CPUs that you have on the server that you're going to perform this training on. So maybe, you know, if you're lucky, you have 32 CPUs or even, let's say, 64. And that's pretty incredible. But what happens if you have thousands of hyperparameter combinations that you'd like to try out? Then you need to go distributed, and Ray is an interesting framework um, that can help you perform lots of hyperparameter processes in parallel across many different servers. So maybe you have cluster with thousands of cores, and then with Ray, you can run your hyperparameter tuning in parallel on all of those thousands of cores. So there are many different optimization algorithms available for performing hyperparameter tuning. Uh, one example would be random search, which is a very naive algorithm, as is grid search. In, in the case of random search, I might have a hyperparameter such as the learning rate. And I'd like to try out different learning rates between, let's say, 0 0.01 and 0 0.3. So what I might do is pick a random number in that range, 0 0.01 to 0 0.3, and then train the model and then see its performance after a certain number of uh, epochs that have been trained. Uh, that's random search. And you might say, well, that's, you know, I, might, I may run 20 experiments, but maybe all of them are concentrated in the higher or lower ranges and I don't cover all of the range uh, very well. So what you might say is I'm going to use grid search instead. So in the grid search case, you might say, well, I'm going to have all of the, I'm going to, have to run 20 experiments. So I'm going to take 20 samples of the learning rate between 0 0.01 and 0 0.3. And those 20 examples will be equidistant from one another. So that, that means that you're going to get good coverage of the space from 0 0.3 to 0 0.1. And hopefully that will give you slightly better performance. Now, another way of, of doing um, uh, uh, hyperparameter optimization is to use what we call a model-based approach. So you don't, instead of just running blind uh, hyperparameter combinations, seeing the result at the end of it, you can have a model of the performance of some combination of hyperparameters, and you can update that model with every result you get back from running an experiment with different combination of hyperparameters. So one example of a very good algorithm for this is tree of Parson estimators. That's pretty much the state of the art nowadays. So if you want to pick one of these, I would pick tree of Parson estimators as, as an algorithm to use. And then the hyperparameter optimization frameworks, there's plenty of them to choose from. If you're doing model training before you do your pipeline, you might also find there's a lot of benefit to using a platform to track experiments. 
So now we talked about different combinations of hyperparameters, running many experiments in parallel, seeing what combinations work best. And we can see a diagram here. We can see some different lines. We can imagine each of these lines is some different combination of hyperparameters. And we want to see which ones work better and which ones didn't. And here we can see we've got these columns with the different combinations of hyperparameters. And this is from an experiment tracking system called Neptune. But there are many of these free serverless experiment tracking systems out there, Weights and Biases, Comet ML, uh, InfiniStore, DagsHub. Um, they're all really good and, um, and they have very, very generous um, free tiers. If you don't want to use a serverless experiment tracking system, there are open source experiment tracking tools like MLflow and TensorBoard that you can also use. But they're very good ways to organize um, your experiments before you uh, have determined you know, what makes a good model architecture, what makes good hyperparameters, but also they give you this reproducibility element that you can, you can see what happened in your experiments over time and, and uh, how you came to the results that you came to. Now in the first lecture we, we talked about the, the, the style of model training that we're going to do in this course and, and also model evaluation and, and this is the pattern in this slide we're showing you how we're going to do it for most of the use cases, that we're going to get train and test sets as features and labels. We're going to use a model. Um, typically, decision trees are popular for, for tabular data, as we said before, like XGBoost. We're going to fit our, our features and our labels from the train set to the model. We're going to evaluate the performance of the model on the test set. And with the predictions Ypred, we're going to compare them with Ytest, the actual labels, to see the performance of our model. So this is pretty much the standard pattern we're going to follow in this course. Um, but, you know, there's plenty more places where you can learn about, about more complicated um, uh, patterns for, for model training than, than the one shown there. Now, once we have our model at the end of the model training evaluation, we'd like to publish it in the model registry. Again, this is Hopsworks. So remember, we see our model can be um, serialized as a pickle Python object. Um, when the model is saved, we saw already that we can put other pickled Python objects in, in that directory along with the model, such as a transformer pipeline. But there's a couple of other things that we can do. One is that we can save a sample row of data along in that directory as well, so that when we want to test the model, that we have some sample data available. And this is very, is particularly when you have a deployed model, in Hopsworks there's a button you can press, which is test, and it will send this sample row of data to the model and you'll get back a results. So this is a really nice way just to check and make sure your model is performing as uh, expected. And secondly, the model has an input and an output schema. And this is uh, this input schema is effectively the, the input features and then the output schema are the labels. So we have Xtrain as the input. Uh, we can take it by passing just our, our, our data frame with the with the features of from the train set. Um, we can basically extract the input schema uh, transparently. So we pass that into the schema object and it extracts um, the input schema and we do the same for the labels and we get the output schema. So this makes up the schema, the input schema, the output schema is the model schema. So the model itself, you can think of it, its API is defined as the schema. We have rows that come in for training and for serving. This is the, uh, the correspond to the input schema. And then the output, the labels, uh, correspond to this output schema. Now, in lab one, we created uh, what's called a Python model serving server. So this is effectively a Python program that will take in uh, a, an input and uh, it'll have a predict method. It'll take the input. It'll use the model to call predict and then it will return the result to the client. So there are other options. There's also the mr.tensorflow to create a model serving server for tensorflow and mr.scikit-learn, sklearn to create a scikit-learn model. I think soon there's going to be um, one for PyTorch as well, mr.pytorch. Now, when we save the model, uh, the model has a version and a name, so we can uniquely identify it. And if we want to uh, update the model over time, we can create new versions. Um, but we can also uh, store with the model a dict of uh, metrics, so the evaluation metrics that we computed when we trained the model. And we saw on the previous slide that we can compute metrics like the F1 score for a, a classification model. And we can store those metrics uh, in this stick that we just passed to the create model function and it will make those available on the model registry in Hopsworks. 
Then we have the schema, the input schema and output schema for the model, uh, this sample row of data to make it easy to test it. And then we call save on the model directory, which, which uploads the, all of this data to the model registry. Um, so any files in that model directory will be stored in the model registry. Now, uh, one question we, that might be of interest to some of you is, where is all this data stored? So Hopsworks is going to store the models and the features. Um, we said already that the models are going to be stored as files. So if we think about what, what does that mean? Well, Hopsworks provides a file system. It actually stores the data in a bucket in S3 or, or, or GCS or ADLS and has a HDFS API called HopsFS. But this is effectively a file system. So the features will be stored as files, so hoodie tables in the file system in a, in a directory called featurestore.db. If you go into your project in Hopsworks, you'll see the files in there. They're going to be Parquet files and there'll be some hoodie files. And if you go into the models uh, directory in your project, you'll see the names of the models at the top level and then the versions of them in the subdirectories and then the files inside there. So these, these are what we call artifacts. And, and in effect, Topsworks file system is an artifact store. It stores features, it stores models. Uh, it also stores training data if you want to. So we can put training data in there as another artifact. Uh, but the training data might also be in a separate bucket in S3. It depends. Now, for all of these artifacts, we're going to also have um, metadata. So if we have features, they have an owner, we need to know who used them, where they were used, what trained data sets, what models. We have to say who has read access, who has write access, so access control. We saw also when we write features to the feature store, we'll compute descriptive statistics for them. Um, we saw also when we create a model that we have a lot of metadata around the model, who's its owner, the metrics, what, data set, what training data set created this model, uh, was used to create this model, and so on. And we haven't covered yet model deployments, but models can be deployed behind network endpoints. And um, those models can be running or stopped or failed. And they have performance. All of this at the top level is what we call metadata. So it's data about data, is what metadata is. And Hopsworks provides a meta store internally that stores all this data for you. So that just tells you where, where your data is stored ultimately when you're writing and reading from Hopsworks platform, whether it's features or models you're reading or writing. Now, one point I'd like to cover just before we move on is, is labeling, because we are talking about model training, but to get to model training, we need supervised machine learning. We need to have labels to, to at, at the very end. So you know, when, when we're making predictions on our models and um, we write the predictions, we saw in the Iris case, we wrote those predictions back to the feature store. Uh, we also had the outcomes. We knew what the labels were because we had a synthetic um, uh, uh, data creation function which created the, the, the sample flowers and also knew what type of flower it was. So we we're able to read the label directly from there, that table. Um, but in, in the general case, it's not always the case that the label will be available immediately or even that the label will be available at all. Sometimes you have to make do with a proxy so you're not going to know the actual label. You might know an outcome such as sales increased, uh, fraud decreased. But for an individual credit card number, you might get the actual output. But if we take the, the, the project example of credit card numbers, you will actually probably get the output. We'll need to know whether a given credit card transaction was considered fraudulent or not. And the way this works in, in, in banks, for example, is that you have what are called investigators. And these investigators' job is to determine if a credit card transaction is fraudulent or not. And that person will do some investigations offline. They'll um, maybe talk to the police. And uh, when they discover credit card transactions that are fraudulent, they're going to label them. And that's going to be a table in a database. Um, you're not going to label all of the credit card transactions. You've got potentially billions of them. So just the ones that are fraudulent, you may, you may uh, annotate as fraud, and the other ones are assumed to be is fraud is false. And often this will be stored in, a, in an operational database because the, the person, the investigator, is just working maybe against a, a hacked up system or some uh, vendor system for entering in uh, which credit card transactions are fraud. So what you might get in here, what, what's important to get, because we want to join this data back with um, the feature pipelines that are, that are creating new features is we need to have join keys. So in this case, credit card number is useful. The date time, event time could also be useful. 
But in particular, the transaction ID is a great way of joining together the data because the transaction ID will be will be globally unique. Um, so you, we can use this to, to, to take the prediction and store this transaction ID with the prediction so that when we get the outcome in this separate label table, which is maybe in a separate database, and we could make it an external feature group in Hopsworks, and, and that way we can join that um, uh, the, you know, the, the, this labeled table from outside of the feature store with the existing uh, feature groups inside the feature store to create training data. And remember, labels don't need to exist in the online feature store because uh, the online feature store uh, doesn't know the labels. It's making predictions. It just needs pre-computed features. It doesn't need to know uh, the labels. It's only going to be in the offline feature store of the labels. Now, another point that's relevant to training pipelines are, is what we call data-centric AI. It's a, it's a relatively recent term, I think maybe coined by Andrew Eng, at least popularized by Andrew Eng, at least. Um, and much of machine learning in the last 10 uh, years or so has been what we call model-centric ML. A lot of the courses are what we call model-centric machine learning. The idea is that here's a data set like the Iris data set, or here's a data set for deep learning like MNIST or um, uh, some other data set and your job is to then uh, train a model to be as accurate as possible and things you can do is optimize your model architecture maybe for using deep learning add some new layers um, tune your hyperparameters to improve your performance um, you often want to make sure that you can optimize the model to deal with uh, noise in unseen data so uh, you can maybe take a hit on the model in terms of its performance in the trained data set, but its generalization uh, capabilities are, are, are still good um, because now it can handle uh, noise in the test set. The model, um, generally you're gonna take small steps to improve the model performance. So maybe you're gonna add batch normalization as one of the layers in your deep learning network. Maybe you're going to add uh, some regularization technique in there. Um, um, that's going to prune the number of links uh, between the, the, the neurons. Uh, you add all these small steps and then your model performance gets iteratively better and better. Um, and if, for example, your model in the wild is going to have some data that's not correctly labeled and uh, maybe the training data set, we can never guarantee that it's going to be that good because maybe some of the labels will be bad. But we'd like to just train the model to handle uh, some of these problematic labels. You'll, you'll see these in well-known data sets like MNIST. There's some, many of the, the numbers are incorrectly labeled. So this is a classic model-centric uh, machine learning that many of you will be familiar with. Uh, data-centric AI or data-centric machine learning has a different set of principles. The basic idea is don't try, just try and tune the model. Why don't you concentrate your effort on fixing the data instead of fixing the model? So the goal of data-centric uh, ML, one of them is to to optimize your data, your input data, to improve model performance. And you can uh, improve data quality as well. So rather than have to train your models to deal with um, uh, some data that's that's of, of dubious quality, um, you can just make sure that you remove the poor quality data before it enters the feature store. You'd like to improve your data over time. So rather than just have your model Iterative will be made better by adding more um, layers or adding regularization. Um, as more data arrives and that data is kept of sufficiently high quality, uh, what should happen is that the accuracy of your model should improve. And there's some very well-known papers written about this, in particular by Google. Um, the one of them is is, is very well known. It's it's about the um, uh, the, the surprising um, benefit of having huge data sets that, that we've seen some the, uh, predictive performance increases logarithmically with the size of the data set. And that was seen for a couple of different data sets. Uh, so not just in vision, but also in natural language processing, which makes many people think that this relationship that the, the, you can get model performance to improve logarithmically with uh, data set size is independent of the type of model that you're trying to train for, in particular for deep learning. This is often considered the case. So data-centric uh, AI is really about improving your data to improve the performance of your models rather than just tuning the models themselves. So the last section for today are batch inference pipelines. Now we covered this in the first lab. We had a batch inference pipeline that we wrote 
And the batch inference pipeline is part of the larger, what we call analytical machine learning system. An analytical machine learning system is one that uh, takes batches of data and, and runs on a schedule and, and makes predictions on a schedule. So maybe it's gonna make predictions every hour, every day, uh, but it's gonna take the new data that's arrived uh, in along with the model, make the predictions and output them to some um, downstream system. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail when we have the introduced the feature view that we introduced here. So in this case, we have a feature view which consists of features from feature group A and feature group B. And we have a, a primary key and we have an event timestamp column for both of these um, feature groups. And what we'd like to do is basically uh, retrieve some feature data uh, for inference. And what that might be, for example, is that we want uh, all of the inference data that arrived on this date, the 11th of October, uh, 2022. So we can see we've got some data at 10 a.m. and some data at 11 a.m. And similarly, at feature group B, we have some data arrived at 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. So what we want to do is we, when we create the feature view, we have our feature view that, that has all of these features from feature group A and feature group B. We want to get inference data. We want to get a batch of inference data for uh, uh, making our new predictions with. And, and in this case, we're gonna say, I want just the data, the feature values that arrived in the last 24 hours. So what we can have is a filter. And in this case, it's not, it, it, the filter is, is when we call the batch data, we're gonna supply the start time and the end time um, for, our, uh, uh, for our feature data. And then that data will arrive at our, at our Python program here, the batch inference pipeline. It'll make the predictions on that batch of data from the last day, and then it'll output the data. And typically it'll store those predictions in some sort of database. And the reason why you often store your predictions in a database is because the two main downstream users, one is for batch inference pipelines, we often have dashboards as downstream users. So you might have something that's predicting sales or it's doing customer segmentation. Um, or it's doing financial projections. And this is where dashboards are very good. Your, your dashboard is gonna show you these predictive models of the world. Um, and you know you can, you can basically get feedback every day or every hour when they're updated and refreshed with the new data that's written to the, uh, this uh, data store here. The other place where you can use uh, your predictions in operational systems. And I think we gave an example at the beginning of the course of Spotify Weekly. So Spotify Weekly is a very famous uh, recommendation system. Once a week, you get a bunch of songs recommended to you. So once a week, the batch inference pipeline at Spotify, it read up all of the users of Spotify. So I think they have hundreds of millions of users. So for the hundreds of millions of users, they read up the last, uh, I'm not sure exactly how much um, uh, data they read up in terms of features, because you could use a lot of data. You could use last week or month, or um, you could just use the last 10 entries for each user. But they, they read up some data to help uh, recommend songs, but they did it for all of the users. So uh, they write out the, the predictions for 200 million odd users. And if even only 10 million log in in the next week, they have 190 million predictions lying in their large Cassandra database that are unread because the next week they're going to be overwritten by the next recommendations. So this is quite inefficient. Um, and the reason why, 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 why these... Um, batch inference pipelines driving operational systems still exist is because they're operationally easy, much easier than doing an online um, recommendation system. So uh, operational systems can use uh, this, you know, historical data generated by batch inference pipelines. It may be good enough for many use cases and may not be good enough for other ones. You really have to do this on a case by case basis to understand if it's good enough. Now I mentioned how do we um, uh, get in our, 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 our training, um, uh, sorry, our batch scoring data from the last day. Well, here's an example of some code for this. Um, firstly, to remind ourselves when we uh, have a feature view that has, has transformation functions, we need to supply the training data set version so that transformation functions know which training data statistics to use when they're computing them. Um, the, in this case, we're going to specify a start time and an end time to the batch of data we're getting for, for, for inference. So in this case, um, we have our, our, um, our start time, uh, it, our, our end time is today, end of today, and our start time is a day before today. And what we do is we basically say, uh, 
Um, get me a batch of data with the start time as being today and the uh, sorry start time being yesterday and the end time being today. And in this case, in this example, we get back a data frame. Now, sometimes your feature view can also have some helper features. Sometimes you might need to to have the the, the user ID or cut or the credit card number in the feature view. It's not a feature we use to train a model. It's not a feature we use for inference. So you might need to drop uh, that credit card number because. Um, you don't want to include it in your training set or in your inference set. So in this case, we have actually three features that we don't need. So we just remove them uh, from the data frame. We drop them. And these are the features we're going to use to score the model with. So we call model.predict uh, on that data frame at the end. Uh, now, in order to, to, to score this, this batch of, of inference data, we need to download the model first. And now we've downloaded a model, we can then score our, our features underscore DF data frame with the model. So that brings us to the third lab. And the third lab will be the fraud training pipeline and the batch inference pipeline. So we had in lab two, we had the, the feature pipeline for a credit card fraud problem. Now we can create the training pipeline from those features and the batch inference pipeline from those features as well. That's it. Um, in the next lecture or next module, we're going to cover user interfaces, um, serverless user interfaces. Um, but you have another great lab and homework ahead of you in the third module, and this is the training and batch inference pipelines for the credit card fraud example. Good luck with that.